Mervyn and Joy have been amazing friends of ours for I don't know how many, almost a century, <laughs> half a century anyhow. And uh, Merv has never lost his vision for, um, for, for the mission field and he works tirelessly very, very much to, uh, to see the dream that God has put in his heart fulfilled. And Merv and Joy, it's really a great privilege to have you here this morning. Hallelujah. Oh, what time do we knock off? The cows have got to be milked. Oh. Praise God. Wonderful to be here this morning and, and share many I know. Hallelujah. Uh, some I don't know, but we just appreciate you. Appreciate being here. Uh, somewhere about, uh, oh, 78 or somewhere like that. Uh, Neil got kicked out of the nest. He was a nice little safe Sunday school teacher in Brisbane. And uh, uh, he got moved. And uh, I was at his first meeting over somewhere and uh, in the Sunshine Coast. And we were there for some time. Uh, we are actually farmers. And uh, we were farmers then. I think Neil used to come to our place and I'd cut up a bullock for him and give him a bit of meat and things like that. Uh, still farming. Um, I farm people now. And uh, I farm cows. And I also farm money. Oh, I thought I'd get a bit of a response from that. Uh, I, I know where the money is. I can always dig in the right place. And uh, we need millions. Come on, I want you to understand today. Personally, I have no interest in money. But uh, for the ministry of spreading the gospel across nations, we need millions, multiple millions. To reach our nation, this nation, we need multiple millions. But God is going to raise up people with the capacity to generate finance and release them so that they will begin to bring finances into the kingdom of God for the purposes of... Uh, of the extension of his kingdom. And uh, today I just want to share a few thoughts, but I want to just share a little from the word. But, you know, we've been traveling many places and uh, we now support and resource over 6,000 pastors across 40 nations. Uh, do I have to get this closer? We. 6,000 plus pastors in 40 nations. And uh, God is good. God has given us the ability to, to generate finances and uh, we're able to support people and that's exciting. And uh, one of our goals with people, particularly in third world and developing nations, is to see them become self-sustainable. That's a big deal, big issue in, in the developing and third world nations where pastors uh, struggle just to get food for their families. And uh, lots of things, lots of corruption is entered into, even by pastors, and different situations just to try and survive. So getting people, getting pastors to a place where they can begin to generate their own income and we do that in various ways, but one of the operations that we are very big in is establishing cooperatives or NGOs so that people within the church also can get involved and they can get small cash loans to be able to generate some business and then that means they can give because if you've got nothing to give, you can't give, can you? So uh, this has been very, very successful and we've, we've been blessed in that area and and probably now most of the time in our travels, we really talk about money, generating money. Uh, I love to preach the gospel. I love to have crusades. Uh, I still do that where the opportunity is available, but I, I like to teach people how to become self-sustainable in the ministry and uh, get themselves back up on their feet so that they can begin to touch their nation for Christ. And uh, we're living in an age where most of us, I'm sure today here, would probably believe Jesus is coming soon. Uh, I personally believe I'm going to see him in my lifetime. I don't know what you think, but that's what I believe. 
and, and I'm not dead yet and I'm not going to die for quite a while, but uh, I believe he's coming very soon. And if we could all begin to believe that, even if we don't see him before we pass on, we could be doing more than what we are now in relation to bringing people into the, the kingdom of God. I'm sure down here you've heard uh, Franklin Graham is having crusades right across our nation in February and uh, February, March. And I believe that this is going to be something that's going to impact our nation significantly. And as a church, we are very involved. And uh, I just really believe God that God is going to start a major move out of this program. Some of you remember back to when Dr. Billy Graham came to Australia uh, and the amount of impact that he had on our nation was ginormous in reality. And uh, I believe we're going to see something fantastic over the next little while in relation to this. So God's good, amen? And uh, I, I just want to thank you this morning for the opportunity. Um, we've come down to see we have family here. Darwin's a fair way away, as most of you are aware. Uh, if you're a little older, don't drive, get on a plane. And uh, if you need somewhere to stay, well, we can give you accommodation and even food free uh, in Darwin for as long as you want to stay. If you stay too long, I'll make you work. Uh, but uh, God is good and uh, he's faithful to us and we just appreciate that. Appreciate Pastor Neil for his, his friendship and... Uh, uh, I don't think he thought I was a good bloke when I actually left Nambour and went elsewhere. I th actually, I think he, he thought I was a bad boy, but he's since gotten over that, and uh, they are we good mates, and uh, we catch up quite frequently and when we can, and today is just a great opportunity. Amen? So I want you this morning just to, to uh, turn with me if you've got a Bible, and um, I just want to share a very simple word, but I hope it's a provoking word, because God's here to stir us. You know, I have one of those electric prodders when I'm working in my cattle yards, and if a cow disobeys, I prod it. And it, uh, if you don't know what an electric prodder is, it's a, it's a little stick that's got a batteries in it, and, and uh, when you push a certain little button, you can stick it on, and when those two prongs touch somewhere on the cow, it gives them an electric shock. Uh, not severe, but enough to get them the idea that uh, there's a, <laughs> get their attention and let them know that there's someone that's in control. And so I want us this morning just to, to look at Psalm chapter, seven, uh, chapter 84, and I believe verse 11, somewhere around there. Just one verse I want to just share and encourage us this morning with. And the Lord says here, well, through the psalmist, For the Lord is a son, S-U-N, a son and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Now, this is a very powerful passage of Scripture, and uh, I want us just to look at it a little bit more and a little closer. It's uh, something that we can begin to see this morning. For the Lord is a sun and a shield. Is that what it says on your... Yes, it is. A sun and a shield. So he's the light. Amen? He's the light. And uh, not only is he the one that gives us light for us to see where we are to, to walk. Come on, are you hearing me today? But he's our shield. That means the devil, you can blow raspberries at him. Because he can't touch us. That's what the scripture says. And God is around us, and he's walking before us, and he's walking with us, and he's protecting us. You know, just recently I had a bit of an issue uh, physically, and uh, I contacted some situation, and, and uh, a lot of people die from what I contacted. And some people said, oh, this is terrible for Merv. But the Bible says no deadly thing shall harm you. And uh, I made a very strong procl proclamation that I haven't finished the work that God has given me, so therefore I'm not going anywhere. Come on, are you with me this morning? That's, that's the attitude, that's the hope, that's the belief that we must all have an understanding of, 
because God's not only our light, but he's our shield. And the Lord will give grace and glory, and no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. That's what I really want to just share a bit this morning about walking uprightly. You know, it doesn't talk about, you know, they tell us our forefathers used to walk on four, eight, uh, four, like down like this somehow. Um, if that was your forefather, it wasn't mine. Uh, but God wants us to walk uprightly. In other words, God wants us to walk circumspectly. He wants us to walk in a way that honours him. And as believers, everything that we do, not just on Sunday morning when we're at church, but everything that we do must be identifying the fact that, one, we are a believer and we are someone that's in relationship with God, but it also must demonstrate to others that there's something different about us. I often tell people, you know, you may be the only Bible some people will ever read. And that's realistically the attitude that we must develop and have an understanding of and walk in such a way that people can see us in our business transactions when we're dealing uh, with, with people outside and in our particular role, I deal a lot with, with unsaved people. I enjoy talking to people that are not saved and not born again. Uh, I don't believe in forcing the gospel down their cake hole. But I do believe that if we live in such a way that's walking uprightly, they will see something different about us. You know, I have a man working for us, uh, a lot of men actually, but I have a man working for us on our cattle property. And when he first got engaged with us, he was just released from prison the day before. He's about 45, 48, and he spent most of his life in prison. And I said to him, I said, Jed, uh, do you believe in God? And he said, no. He said, I don't believe in God. He said, the only religion I have is the religion of the American Red Indians. And of course, he never knew what that was either, but that was just his story. Uh, but today, I would say he's, he's that close from coming to Jesus. Not because I've pumped him with the word, but because of my life. And he sees something different. You know, he's tried to look at other things and get other friends. And, and a little while ago, he joined the fire brigade up there, the local bush fire brigade, because he wanted some more friends. And they've all let him down. But Merv's still there. You know, it, it, it's our life that counts for God. Amen? Walking uprightly. You know, we, we're just coming into this period where Christmas time and, and uh, we all love getting gifts. You know, one of the things I've found as you get older, mostly your, your kids give you handkerchiefs or socks. Come on, we had our little Christmas in Darwin before we left, and I'm not sure how many packets of handkerchiefs I got. But my son that lives there with us, he said, well, Dad, you could sew them all together and make a sheet out of them. And I said, well, I don't usually use a sheet, so what use would that be? So, you know, my concept here is we need to be able to share or give to somebody else what we've been given. Amen? So if I was close to you, you'd probably get a box of hankies this year. <laughs> but my thought is this, and the reason I said that this morning is this. Many of us are hoarders. Hoarders. If God challenges you, it wouldn't move. <laughs> no, you're wrong. You're wrong. I, oh, mate, that's all money, not, not hoard. Neil's been to my place, so he's saying that I'm a hoarder. No, no, no. You know, every one of us, as Christians, we come to church on Sunday. We sit down and we enjoy the word, we get up and we say, oh, I didn't Neil preach well today. Praise God, hallelujah. And then we bolt out of the doors, and we go home, and what we received on Sunday morning, we hoard. We don't share it with somebody else. And this is what I want us to, to come to a place today of grasping hold of, if nothing else. Every morning, every Sunday morning, every time we have fellowship, 
we come into the presence of God, and there was a beautiful presence of God here this morning. And, you know, God doesn't live in temples made with hands. He lives in us. And when we come together, he's here. And his presence is here in this place. And we carry that presence. Come on. We don't have just to be together. We carry the presence of God. So we've got something that we can, we can give to other people. But we go home and we just, well, it was a nice day and it was really good. And, and we hoard, we hold on to what we've been given at that particular meeting. And God is going to hold us responsible for people that are going to hell. And this is one of the, the, one of the passions that drives me and drives us uh, as, a, as, a, as a family, as an organization. We take this very seriously. God has given something to us to give. He's given something to us to share. And so God is wanting us to call, get a hold of the word today and begin to do something with it. Last Sunday, the week before, whenever. Do something with what he's given to us. Because churches across our nation, by and large, are getting lesser and lesser in number. Come on, I know it's Christmas, I'm not talking about today. People are just not bothering anymore. People are backsliding because they, for whatever reason. But God wants us to take what we've got and begin to look like we've got something and we're going somewhere and begin to share it with those outside. You know, Christianity is not about coming to church on Sunday. Christianity is about living a lifestyle that's going to impact others. Come on, are you with me? You know, in our church at home, I am constantly looking for people in my congregation that I can raise up to be a leader. And most Sunday mornings, and obviously as we saw this morning, we, Neil didn't take communion. He had somebody else taking communion. Brother, wherever you are, God bless you. Uh, I'm looking to raise other people up. What for? Well, God doesn't invest all his power in the pastor. Amen? God, in, God invests it in his people. And we so often hold what we've got, one, because we don't know what to do with it, or two, we're never given an opportunity. And so I'm encouraging us this morning, regardless of what you think you have, and you know, most of us are like the rest of us. Most of us have a bit of a complex about something. You know, I grew up with a very inferiority complex. I think my mate Neely was a little bit sort of shy in his early days. Uh, and we've all got something we're trying to hide behind or we allow to cover us and stop us. But come on, God doesn't look at our little things that we grew up with because he reminds us every now and then, if any man is, is in Christ, he's a new creation. And all things are passed away. Hey, come on, all things are passed away. Hallelujah. All things are passed away. That's that fear. That's that inferiority. That's that, that shyness. All things are passed away. And behold, all things are new. But we just fail to step out of where we were to begin a new life. You know, and, and within this congregation this morning, there are people here who... who uh, have got great capacities and talents. We see talent on the platform today. Plenty of people playing different instruments. Uh, and there'll be others here that can play. There's other people here that can uh, love to talk to people. You know, recently, Joy and I and some of my, our family went on a cruise out of Cairns. We went up around New Guinea and it was a 10-day cruise. And man, it was the most beautiful. If you've never been on a cruise, go and have one. What a fantastic holiday. All the food you get and, and everything, you know, just such a great thing. But, you know, I love talking to people. And it's a, what an opportunity to go and talk to people. I, there was an old lady that was blind. I saw her walking around with a little thing, you know, and I thought, I'll talk to that old girl. So she was she's probably younger than me, I suppose. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I went down and found her one day, and I sat, went down and sat down with her and started to talk to her now. I think she thought I was sort of coming on a bit, you know. And uh, 
And the next day I wasn't around and she said to somebody, where's that Mervyn? Anybody know where that Mervyn is? And uh, so I had to go and see her the next day. Uh, I, I just love to talk to people. It gives you an opportunity, hey? Yes. <laughs> gives you an opportunity to, to share with them. And again, you don't have to pump the gospel down people's nose. Come on, it's a matter of living that life that people can see, hey, there's something different about this person. There's something, you know, who, who would want to just go and sit down with some old bird that was walking around with a little ball on the end of a stick, you know? Uh, God wants us just to go out of our way to be able to share that love that he has for us. Amen. We, we heard about that this morning in communion. We, we know very clearly uh, about his love and what he's done for us. And uh, we, we've got so much to give. You know, I know Neil wants to build a big church and uh, maybe he'll have his own building. Who knows? But maybe Jesus will come back before then. But, but there's lots of other activities I see. <laughs> Lots of other activities. There's, there's other meetings you can attend. You know, uh, in, our, in our place, we, we're looking at developing, already have quite a few going. We're looking at hope, starting home churches and pushing out into the community. And to, to start a home church, you need a home church leader. Come on, so we're looking for leaders to take role, roles to spread the gospel across our community. You know, we, a lot of the work we do in India we work with a guy, you know, Randy Bender. We work with a guy in India, and, and he's he's an amazing man. Last last year, 17, 2017, 2018, he had 87,370 souls saved for Jesus. This year he's this year he's he's targeting 200,000. Hey, he'll reach it. He will reach it. You know, and all that predominantly is through house churches, because once you activate your people and give them the, the ability to do something then the church begins to grow and spread. He has a church in his, in his main city uh, and another one in the neighbouring city, but all the rest is house churches. And so, come on, we need to just start strategies and start to develop concepts, and we need to first motivate our people. And so my message this morning is almost over, and everybody said, praise God. But let's, let's not be a hoarder of the blessings that God has given to us. Come on, not, don't hoard things. You notice in that verse we read this morning, no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. No good thing. What an amazing, what an amazing thing. You know, let me just tell you a little story in, in closing. Uh, Neil's been there. Did I tell you the other day I got my new plane? Ah, oh, praise God. You know, someone just gave me a plane, an airplane. An aeroplane. You know, we had one before, but we sold it. And uh, someone just gave us a new, uh, not, not new one, but it's a good one. And it's now sitting in our shed at the farm. I got our own airstrip there, and God has done us good. Isn't God good? What do I want an aeroplane for? Well, I really don't want it. I don't need it. I'll probably go for a couple of joints around the property and have a bit of a look, and then I'm going to cash it. Put the money into missions. That's a good idea. Come on, are you with me this morning? No good whole thing will he withhold from you. No good thing will he withhold from you. You know, we've got, we've got a fairly big property and um, some years ago there were some men <coughs> doing some drilling on our property and they would never tell me what they were looking for. I used to ask them, they were drilling holes here, there and everywhere and, and they would never tell me what they were looking for. And uh, one day... One day, I talked to one of the younger guys on the, on the drilling rig, and I said, uh, what are you guys after? And, oh, anything, whatever's there. I said, okay, well, be a bit more specific. What did you find today? And he said, well, we didn't find anything. But he said, we went through 20 metres of river gravel before we hit the rock. River gravel. Okay. Now, that mightn't mean anything to you. But when I heard river gravel, that stuck in this little thing here. And just this, this year, we've explored it. We've found how much is there. We know exactly how much it's worth. And now we're laughing all the way to the bank. Come on, are you hearing me? 
if I just if I just sell it to someone for royalties, it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to our organisation. If I just sell it sell it for royalty price, which is three dollars a ton, there's seventy million seventeen million dollars there. Neil, that's not a bad slab. I told you, didn't I? How much did you want? I told. You. God will hold, withhold nothing from he who walks uprightly. You know, just before I left, I was talking to a good friend of mine who would probably be the man who actually brings the gravel out. And maybe you don't know this, but I'm going to tell you it's nothing new and it's nothing to do with if you, you if you live in Queensland. But in the north, we have a lot of gas. We have gas wells out in the sea and we have gas wells on the land and we've got gas everywhere. And we've just had a company uh, from Japan that found gas off Broome. And they piped it all across to Darwin and built a facility in Darwin that's just sent its first gas after six years. It employed 6,000 men for six years to build this big refinery thing. And they just recently, the Prime Minister of Japan and our Prime Minister was there when the first shipment went out. Uh, but they've allowed now in the territory what they call fracking. And uh, some people are against it and some people are opposed and there was a lot of opposition and, and all the rest of it. And uh, all that is that they just drill down deep into the under, underworld and they might even find the devil down there, I'm not sure, but they're just drilling down there. And then they just sort of shake a little bit and, and uh, open up some cracks in the ground and let the gas come out. And uh, so that all sounds exciting. Uh, but just before I left, I found out that they need a special sand to put down the holes when they're fracking. And the closest access they've got to it at this point in time is for it to come from Adelaide. And it's going to cost them incredible quantities of funds. But would you believe... <laughs> No good thing will he withhold for those who walk uprightly. The product that's on our property is just what they want, plus a lot of other byproducts. Isn't that amazing? Imagine what we'll get for that per meter. Hallelujah. Come on. Don't say this morning that, oh, that's nice for Merv to say things like that. No, no, no. God will give you one, the desires of your heart, but he will also give you whatever it is you need to do what he's called you to do. There are people in the room today that will travel to other nations and speak. You might say, oh, but I'm not a great preacher. Well, who knows where you'll end up. Who knows what nation God will take you to? You might say, well, I don't need to travel. There's enough issues in our own nation. Well, are you ready? Are you ready? I personally believe, as I said earlier, that there's going to be a shaking next year when Franklin Graham comes. I believe it's going to be the beginning of the end time harvest in our nation. Come on, are you with me? And the end time harvest is going to cost multiple millions. Come on, some of you here got the capacity to generate money. Well, just take what you need to live and give the rest to God so as he can utilize it for the purposes of the extension of his kingdom. So this morning, my message is simply this. Don't be a hoarder. Give out. And Neil's little joke about the things that Merv hoards. That's right. It might come in handy one day. But Neil, you'll be surprised when you come back. It's nearly all gone. <laughs> Hallelujah. God bless you. Have a great Christmas. And we really have... Pre yeah, it's still Christmas, isn't it? Yes, it's Christmas. Have a great Christmas on Monday or Tuesday, whenever it is. Uh, Tuesday. And uh, have a good time with your family. And friends, buy Neil a special present. Maybe a hanky or something like that. He can probably do it with a hanky. And... Uh, Appreciate you all. God bless you.
Oh, dear Jesus, do you believe that? Do you believe that? Merv and Joy uh, so actually millions of dollars into the, into the kingdom. What they're talking about is not just uh, hearsay. They put actually millions and millions of dollars. I wouldn't have a clue. Uh, but they do. They put it into the kingdom and uh, they've been fantastic. I believe that Merv carries a gift to create wealth. Like he bought an old farm. It just so happened that the Mary River used to run through that farm, but it's dry now. It's a big river bank. That's what he's talking about, all that gravel. Then he's got the special sand that, that uh, they make Bessa blocks out of. And uh, he's also, there's other products there. There's stones and there's gold. <laughs> Goodness knows what he's going to find in that thing. But I, I honestly believe in impartation. How many people believe in that? And what I would love for Merv to pray for people today, that if you believe that God is speaking to you, that he wants to use you to create wealth for this end-time kingdom, for this end-time harvest, I would love for you to stand to your feet, come out the front and allow Merv and Joy to pray over you, to believe God. You might say, I'm a pensioner. Well, you don't know what's in your backyard <laughs> if you start digging. But God can create something. He might create a dream. You might, look, the other day I wrote a song. <laughs> so anything can happen. You could, you could write a book. You could, God can give you creative ideas and things like that. But Merv, it would be a very big surprise for me. Joy, he hasn't got rid of all that stuff, has he? How many caravans has he got still there? How many boats? How many boats? Hey? <laughs> he had that many boats. <laughs> he had that many washing machines. He had that many fridges. He had that many bulldozers and tractors and things. But... I do believe that Merv has got a gift to create wealth. So if you are kingdom-minded and you want to have an impartation into your life, let's all stand to our feet. Those that want to come out, Joy and, and Merv, would you come and would you pray? It's Joy, you're just as much a part of this as anybody. So just come right now. Come on. You just don't, don't be shy. Don't be shy in coming. Don't be shy in coming. Don't think, oh, I've got nothing to give. You never know. what You could write a song. You know that Darlene Check was sitting there one day and she wrote a song in 15 seconds and it created millions of dollars? Millions of dollars. Shout to the Lord, I think it was. And she's written many, many others since then. So come on. Um, musicians, you guys can come out the front too if you want, you know, for God to touch your life, to be able to cre create wealth. Uh, or whatever it might be, but come on, let's believe God. Father, we just give you all the praise. We thank you for Merv and Joy. We thank you for the, the gift that's on their life, and I pray for an impartation into people here right now. And, Lord, for that we'll give you all the praise, we'll give you all the glory. And everybody said amen and amen.